Good evening. Welcome to tonight's Fireside Chat with Lyndon LaRouche for Thursday, June 23rd. This is the first of our meetings after our conference of the weekend. And we want to uh, talk a bit about not merely the conference, but the uh, means of activating and deploying that conference, not merely the follow-up to the conference. In other words, this is a different concept. It's partially it's it's uh, motivated by the circumstances that we find ourselves in as we are approaching the end of the second quarter of the year. Um, there are many different meetings that are going on right now. Uh, just to be clear, for example, the, the BRICS, that is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa Association, is going through a sort of rejuvenation um, there was a meeting on the 22nd yesterday of the looks called, called the BRICS Business Summit. Uh, then the 14th annual BRICS Summit occurred today, and then there will be what's called a high-level dialogue on global government, which will be happening tomorrow, June 24th. Um, prior to these developments, China released what they call their Global Development Report, and what it does is it proposes a pathway to uh, end global poverty in eight years by 2030. Ending global poverty in eight years by 2030. Now, that is, of course, a significantly different perspective than one you would re have right now in the United States or, for that matter, in the transatlantic world where there is a general uh, and I think correct perception that what we may be looking at is the uh, short-term ending of the entire system uh, before that happens. The European Union Council is meeting today and tomorrow. The G7 is having a meeting in Bavaria in Germany from Sunday through Tuesday. Uh, Biden will be using that occasion to announce new sanctions. White House officials are saying uh, – and so you have those meetings going on, even as you have massive strikes and demonstrations. In uh, Brussels, there was a demonstration of 80,000 people that occurred, which was against both the war, uh, well, against the, the NATO process, as well as against uh, various of the economic inequities that have, that have evolved in uh, the Netherlands. There was a huge demonstration yesterday against the cur by farmers, conducted by farmers, uh, protesting against the curbs on nitrogen production in that country. Uh, in the United Kingdom, you have the second of three big rail strikes, uh, and you've had unrest in many other countries. Uh, so uh, something else might be, might be included here just in terms of talking about the question of economy and some very important developments uh, in this, uh, in the sense that there are a very important set of, set of discussions going on. Um, the, but but I, I think what I'll do for a moment is just turn to the U.S. Federal Reserve just to give an idea of how deep the problem is. Uh, the deep the problem of delusion is. So Federal Reserve Board Chairman Jerome Powell, in his uh, semi-annual monetary report to the Congress yesterday, said, this is all a quote, the surge in prices of crude oil and other commodities that resulted from Russia's invasion of Ukraine is boosting prices for gasoline and fuel and is creating additional upward place pressure on inflation. And COVID-19-related lockdowns in China are likely to exacerbate ongoing supply chain disturb disturbances. So if it wasn't clear from that, they're trying to say that Russia is to blame for inflation because the inflation is primarily powered by gasoline and fuel prices, not speculation, and not the uh, bailouts of uh, 2007, 2008, and subsequent bailouts, including what was done during COVID. Uh, and then secondly, it's the lockdowns in China that are the problem. That is that the 
orientation that the Chinese government took toward uh, limiting uh, deaths from COVID, uh, which uh, are something in the, in the lower than 10,000 in comparison to the United States, which has 1 million, that these actions have been responsible for the problems that are being uh, uh, encountered uh, in uh, the United States as well as in the transatlantic world. Um, there are some, some interesting and, and uh, useful matters to just take a look at with respect to that, but I'm going to leave that for right now. I want to say something about uh, a story that was on an Indian site which was quoting Vladimir Putin, uh, who, and this is what it said. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Wednesday said that the BRICS countries, again, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, that the BRICS countries are working on reliable alternative payment mechanisms for international settlements. Further, Putin said that creation of an international reserve currency based on the basket of, of the BRICS currencies uh, is also being considered. Uh, and then they have a brief quote from him saying, uh, quote, we are exploring the possibility of creating an international reserve currency based on the basket of BRICS currency. Just essentially gives that story. It's notable that uh, as of yesterday, uh, Vladimir Putin has signed an executive order authorizing uh, that Russia would pay its euro bonds debt in Russian rubles. Uh, the, uh, the, night, the title of the order is Executive Order on the Temporary Procedure for Meeting State Debt Obligations in the Form of Government Securities with Nominal Value Denominated in Foreign Currency, so forth and so on. Um, and so uh, today, the Finance Ministry of the Russian Federation uh, fulfilled obligations on two issues of dollar-denominated euro bonds, and what they did was they sent uh, 12.51 billion rubles, which was equivalent to a payment of $235 million. Uh, and they sent those in, in coupon payments to the National Settlements Depository. So now, in other words, what's happening is that Putin has made the decision that, yeah, we will meet our obligations, but it will not be done in dollars. Uh, it will be done, or in euro, it will be done in rubles. So we'll see what that does. The main point is that you're moving in a certain direction. I wouldn't be looking for the idea that there's extraordinarily dramatic developments that are going to happen tomorrow in the stock exchanges or something like that. The more important point here is the directionality. Uh, one final thing I want to point out just to give people a sense of what the problem is. Uh, you probably heard us say that the issue is that you, if you begin to try to if the Fed begins to try to increase interest rates, uh, what they could end up doing is creating uh, a complete blowout of the international financial system. Now, just to give an idea of why that's the case, let's take a look at home mortgages in the United States. At the point that we had the blowout of, that, of the mortgage-backed securities uh, and related uh, uh, speculative instruments back in 2007, 2008, uh, the U.S., um, the value for U.S. Uh, family home mortgages was uh, $10.6 trillion back then. Today, it is $11.7 trillion. Uh, but now, that's not the same thing uh, as the mortgage-backed security bubble, which is which is in, in, in denominated in separate instruments. That, that bubble is $9 trillion. Uh, this brings the U.S. mortgage bubble to about $21 trillion. So now what, what happens when, 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 when you raise interest rates? Here's an example for you. Six months ago, if you got a house, uh, let's say you got a mortgage on a house, $400,000, 30-year fixed interest mortgage, you could get that, you get an interest rate of about 3% and you would end up paying something approximate to $1,700 a month. That's your mortgage note. But today, for that same transaction as what you could have done six months ago, you were going to pay a 6% interest rate, and you're going to be paying $2,400 a month. 
So what you have is a situation where if people can't pay the payments, and by the way, that's fixed exchange, and if you have movable rates, you've got a problem. And the issue is not merely housing. It's simply to give one example of one area. As you may know, we've referred to this as the everything bubble because every different element of uh, financial instrument that you can name as well as company debt, very importantly, uh, is, is, in the, is in the tanker. Uh, as some will point out, this experiment has never been done in the history of humanity. Uh, those people presently in power would end up creating a circumstance where literally hundreds of thousands of Americans could die nearly instantaneously as a result of something like this. Uh, but there's also another possibility, a very live possibility, a possibility that was made far more alive by actions taken by us, uh, both in the composition of that conference of last week, as well as in some of the electoral activity we've engaged in in the United States with the two candidacies of Diane Sayre and Joel Dijon now being filed. Uh, in the case of, of uh, Diane, we, that we know she's on the ballot, uh, and we presume the same thing will be tr true of Joel. So, so it means that we have the ability to carry out a campaign that was suggested during the conference of last week. And the camp, they came out of a dialogue between Helga and one of the, uh, well, several of the participants, but one in particular, Cliff Kirikoff, uh, who had uh, pay, uh, served in the United States Senate uh, as an aide, as a consultant uh, um, for many years. And the discussion began about the idea of a new Bretton Woods system. Now, this referred to the Bretton Woods, New Hampshire uh, uh, set of post-World War II financial arrangements uh, that were done, uh, creating the world monetary system and the fixed exchange rates in which the dollar was the basis of all of world credit during the period of 1944. Uh, but at the time that that system was created, there was no nation of India uh, there was no, uh, no real nation of China, um, and there were, you know, the 54 nations in Africa, there were like three that existed. So you need to have a, and, and also the dollar, which was then the world's great uh, primary creditor, the dollar has now become the world's primary debtor, which is exactly the opposite circumstance. But it's clear that a blowout of something like the United States economy or the financial system, excuse me, the predatory financial system, because that's what would actually blow out, the actual productivity of the American people, the productivity of others all over the world, also in the European theater, would not be less because of what happened in the monetary system. And the Constitution of the United States uh, gives the power uh, to the Congress of the United States in particular uh, and then the executive acting on behalf of the national interest to issue credit, which is uh, uh, directed, directed credit for production, productive purposes. And what you would have to do is to have an emergency implementation of the original Glass-Steagall, uh, basically cancel about 90% of the debt that's out there. You would definitely be doing that. And then essentially proceeding with a set of arrangements and, and agreements that you'd have to do with several nations to producing uh, the world's way out of what would otherwise not merely be a depression, but a full-scale physical breakdown crisis in the context of emerging unknown diseases capable of threatening the planet as a whole. So we are in that zone now. We're not going to that zone. We're in that zone. And the candidacies and the conferences that we have been having uh, uh, will, are, are capable of recruiting uh, and deploying a whole population uh, of, of, of in different worlds, uh, di different countries, rather, whole populations of different countries in a way that might not have even been conceivable before now. The problem, though, is that with that said, what's the orientation of the people? Because you can't be talking about the, the good old, the regular old experts that have gotten us into this. 
that can't be who's going to lead. So this is going to have to be led by some formation that has yet to be formed or some, or if formed has to be expanded and it has to be international. Okay. It can't just be national, but it's clear that the United States would be playing a central role under any circumstance in that. So we've got to figure out a way to get the American people into shape to play that role. To do that, we have several projects we've embarked on, but one of the projects that we want to talk about at some length tonight is uh, associated with the magazine that some of you have known we have, but we want to sort of focus more on telling you why we put this magazine out, what its intention is, and why it's so important, matter of fact, essential in the present circumstance. Uh, I'll only say in, in closing on this that the optimism uh, that we are able to convey, particularly to those under 30 in the population, uh, will be decisive in whether or not this country or indeed the transatlantic sector can survive. If we are not able to reverse the cultural pessimism that we are facing right now, uh, then there is no way to actually implement any real aspect of any of the policies that are required in this circumstance. It's not a matter of going to get experts. That won't work. You've got to have a population that sees its self-interest in dedicating itself to the future. And to do that, you have to have an optimistic uh, uh, young population which sees its role that way. Otherwise, uh, it, it can't be done. Uh, and so uh, what we want to do is both in terms of the conference and things that people may have to say about that, it may be reflections that people want to give, uh, and in terms of this particular topic, I wanted to have you know, Anastasia Battle uh, speak to us and tell us both not just about the publication, but sort of her own reflections, as well as in what, the way in which the publication, uh, Leonora, uh, can play a role in this phase of our work, which is going to be both more challenging and more exciting than what we've already just done. So, Anastasia, if you're there, please take over. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for having me on. No, I, I really just want to you know, give people a sense of, of um, I mean, I've been on before, but of what we've been trying to do with this magazine. Uh, we've had two issues out so far. Uh, we're, go we're about to be finishing up with the third. And the idea has been, uh, it came out of a process of recruiting an international youth movement that we want to find a way to break people out of their ideologies. Um, to really give people the tools that they need to see the problems in their own society, their own culture, no matter what nation you're from, uh, in order to, to free the other people around you, uh, to become a real organizer in that way. And it is possible. It's possible to free people from their ideas. And I think um, this conference that we saw this past weekend uh, was a real demonstration of that. <laughs> I mean, you had a lot of people, people might know I was in the chat with, with you. Um, there were a lot of arguments <laughs> going on. Not everybody agreed, including the people um, in the, uh, uh, who were who presenters did not agree. Uh, but that wasn't the point. You know, what we're doing as a movement is we're not trying to find agreement. We want people to be truth seekers. What is actually truthful? What's the method to discover what is truthful? And, you know, when you actually jump in and you start looking into those, those kinds of questions, that's where things get exciting. That's where our optimism as an organization comes in. It doesn't come from, you know, being blind and saying that, oh, you know, yes, the world is so great and everything's going to be wonderful and humanity's lovely and da 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 So, yeah, that's, that's nice. <laughs> but real optimism comes from fighting, comes from the desire to fight and change someone. And when you've experienced that moment when you have seen somebody make a discovery and make that breakthrough, that's infectious. And that's, that's, that's what's really fun. 
and and I want to encourage everybody on this call uh, to really work on becoming a better organizer, on using this magazine uh, to do that for yourself, to educate yourself, to become more conscious of the way you think, and to help yourself um, learn how others think, uh, and then to go out and, and help somebody break through their own ideologies. Um, and with that idea, uh, we're, we're starting a, a project to really look at the youth culture right now because it's, it's far worse than it was, I mean, I'm 32, going on 33. It's far worse than it was when I was 15, 16 years old. I mean, it, it's not just simply saying, oh, look at the, you know, boys and girls are confused or, you know, look at all these people with purple hair or something like that. It's, it's, there's something much worse going on. And a lot of the discussion that we've had is looking at what, what are the thoughts that are going on in people's heads? What, what, are the, what are the things that are organizing people? And when I, I'm saying this about what I'm going to say, it's, it's not a, a matter of like shaming someone, you know, look at you, you're just a terrible person or something like that. But you've got to look at this stuff clinically. That's how we're going to be able to break people out of it. Like this question of, of video game addiction and pornography, this isn't about, you know, just shaming somebody into, you know, doing the right thing. But this has been, these kinds of, of things have been imposed on people. There's been actually a training through, you know, the educational system, through the video games themselves. Uh, Mrs. LaRouche brings up, you know, the, this question of Pokemon, how Pokemon, uh, you know, catches youth at a very young age to get them trained in this mindset of, you know, we've got to, you got to kill them, you got to get them, um, you know, beat them up, destroy them. Um, you know, and thinking about if you can catch a youth population, you know, at 8, 9, 10, 11, and completely rip out um, an identity of, of being human, of, of making discoveries, which children are natural at doing. They do it, you know, whether you want to or not. <laughs> they, they want to make discoveries. So how do you extract that from them? So you start training them to do something else. And this existentialism, this um, self-hatred that, that many youth are experiencing right now, um, where they become so frustrated, they act out in violence, whether it's towards themselves or others. Uh, you've got these, these images. You know, I, I was talking to somebody the other day who said that they spent once when they were 15 a whole summer, 1,200 hours, 1,200 hours of their time um, on a video game, uh, a very violent one at that. And... <laughs> You know, we talk about like post-traumatic stress disorder and these kinds of things in veterans. I mean, if you're in front of a screen looking at these kinds of, of images all day, don't you think that's going to be controlling what you think in some way? Now, it's not the same argument as saying video games made somebody kill somebody, but it's a matter of mental training. We have a youth population right now, which is, I mean, Jesus, it's like, you know, 50% of them, really, I, I know I've seen other statistics and whatnot who've said, you know, 25, 30% of youth, 18 to 25 year olds have some kind of mental problem. But given the young people that I'm talking to, I think it's far worse than that. I just don't think many people are expressing it in the same way. Um, so I really think that, you know, this question of looking into what has been controlling um, our youth. How do we break people out of that and what do we replace it with? You know, Mr. LaRouche really emphasized this question of classical culture, which is not just simply a time period of like Mozart and Beethoven or something. You're talking about a method, a method of thinking. And this method, you know, really digs into, into another person and says, 
um, what are the principles that are organizing something? Why does it work the way that it does? How do we know that it's true? And when you have that kind of foundation, when something that's bullcrap comes along, you're not going to be swayed by it. Maybe you might be, you know, tempted to look into it or something, but you're not just going to be, you know, swayed by some kind of nonsense. You're going to have a method to discover if that's even true. So that's what we have to replace uh, the culture that we have right now. Um, you know, it's not just uh, magic. <laughs> you know, I've, I've met some people who've asked, you know, if I just if I just listen to enough Bach, you know, will I become a genius? <laughs> <laughs> or something like, like that, which is, you know, it's incredibly adorable that <laughs> somebody would ask that. Um, but no, it's, it's a matter of training your mind. If, if they can train your mind to do something evil through, through these uh, various tactics and whatnot, then we can train our minds to think at this higher level. And um, so this, this next issue we have coming out of Leonora is really going to get at a number of these questions. What are the ideas right now to break out of World War III? How do we uh, rise to this higher concept? We're going to have a paper from, from Jason Ross, who is a member of the basement team uh, who worked closely with Mr. Lyndon LaRouche just about every day um, when Mr. LaRouche um, was alive for, for, geez, I want to say Jason, like maybe almost 15 years, maybe more, <laughs> but um, on, on Vernatsky, Jason just gave a presentation on this, this, um, this paper uh, at this last conference. Uh, we're going to have a number of other papers on breaking through the digital dictatorship. How is this controlling the way people think? And um, a number of other questions on the historical individual. Uh, Mrs. LaRouche's um, discussion on Operation Ibn Sina and what is the sublime uh, from Friedrich Schiller. Uh, we'll have that as well. So there's going to be a number of things I think that will be incredibly provocative and that you can use. You can go out and use it. Take it to your neighbor. Take it to your, your granddaughter or your, your son and use it to talk, provoke them. That's, that's really the intention of this magazine is um, by the end of the magazine, the person should be so provoked that they cannot help <laughs> but ask a question or be so bothered by it <laughs> that they get a little upset. Uh, and that, that's a good thing because we want to talk to people about this stuff. People should be broken out of this. So um, with that, I'll leave it there. Um, and I want to encourage people to, to ask questions, uh, get active um, with this ideology project you know, help us uh, do these kinds of investigations. You know, you're not just a passive supporter of the LaRouche movement. You are the LaRouche movement. You are an organizer with the LaRouche movement. And I really want to um, encourage people to um, send in reports, send in ideas and thoughts. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Okay, very good. I'm going to go to open up the queue here. Okay, so while people are getting in the queue, let me say a few things about the, uh, the conference itself and about some of the things that we're going to be doing, because it might give you some ideas of what we're thinking. First of all, I don't know, uh, obviously a lot, some people who are or may not have seen any of the conference, so if you go to it, you'll see there are over 30 speakers, there are 30 speakers, and there are various combinations of things. There's, of course, four panels, but then within those panels, there are some, uh, some sections, for example, panel two had a section in which there were five plus farmers, farm leaders that were discussing both the crisis in agriculture and then what could be done globally uh, to feed the world. So that's within the, so you have panels within panels, but then you have also uh, certain presentations that just so, so naturally go together. Uh, and we're going to be putting different combinations of things together. Now, this is something for a lot of people to think about. Uh, you know, we all know that there are these different people out there. Some people are famous or well-known, like Jimmy Dore or uh, some of these other people, Katie Halper or you know, Matt Taibbi or those kinds of people. Then some people are just individuals that do interviews and interview shows. 
um, for that, for those sorts of people, I think you want to think about what, what do we have from the conference that would be most, would most efficiently inspire them to get those presentations we would send them out to uh, their networks as well as what would get them to invite us on. Us meaning any number of people. Harley Schlanger obviously comes to mind. Helga herself under certain circumstances would be right. But we want to have that. And so for those of you who did see the conference, were participants in the conference, if you have ideas to that effect, please let us know that now. Secondly, obviously, if there are questions for Anastasia directly on what she had to say, uh, just bringing up this idea of the way that this, you know, how's a magazine going to have the impact that she's talking about? You know, what, what are her ideas of what would be other people's ideas about how that such a thing would even be possible? What's meant by that? That's certainly an important idea. Uh, and then there may be some other reports along that line. There are a few people in the, in the queue, so I'm going to go back to that. Uh, and, and then just uh, we'll talk a bit more about the, the conference uh, as we can. So let me go to the phones here. 